Hi everyone, welcome to this uh, discussion and conversation with Professor Chaim Bershid uh, Zadner on the, on the launch of his book published by Verso, An Army Like No Other, the Israeli Defense Force. Um, the discussion will be between myself um, and uh, Professor uh, Gilbert Ashkar, uh, Professor in Development Studies at the University of London. Uh, I'm Dina Mutter, I'm the Chair of the Centre for Palestine Studies at SOAS. Um, and I also work in the Center for Global Media and Communication. So um, we will have uh, about uh, 10 minutes of uh, uh, the author, uh, whom I'll introduce in a minute, talking for about uh, 10 minutes, and then we will have some a conversation uh, with Gilbert and myself and uh, the author. Um, without further ado, just to give a brief introduction, about the author, Professor Chaim Bershit Zabner is a filmmaker, photographer, uh, film studies scholars, and a researcher at the School of uh, Oriental and African Studies at SOAS. Um, he has uh, edited uh, many collections with other authors, and he has uh, written, uh, he is the author of uh, Introducing the Holoc Holocaust, which ha he has written with Stuart Hood and uh, Litsa Youngs. His films include a very well-known and uh, well-reviewed State of Danger, which is a BBC documentary about the First Intifada, and London is Burning, about the 2011 uh, riots. He has also published in uh, the Pirates and the La Ram. But I've known uh, Chaim for quite a while, and uh, his work is really impressive, that's very broad. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say about the book. Uh, you've got 10 minutes time now, uh, but in terms of um, the audience, um, you will have to put your comments. There's a comments uh, page uh, where you put your comments there and questions which we will collect and then we, we will, we will uh, pose them uh, to Chaim at the end of the discussion around uh, 10 to 6 or something around that. Um, so hopefully everything will go smoothly in terms of the technology and looking forward to hearing Chaim talking um, about the book. Chaim, over thank, to you. Very, thank you very much, Dina, for your kind words. And I'm very lucky and very honored to have the two of you um, leading academics on the Middle East to discuss the book with. And um, of course, I have used the work of Gilbert um, when I was writing about the Lebanon wars, um, it was crucial for me. Um, I want to thank for everyone who worked on arranging the launch. This was not an easy one. Now, the first thing to say is that um, what the book isn't, Hello. Hello. Yeah, I can um, hear you. I don't. I don't think I'm connected. You Am I connected? Uh, I can um, hear you. Okay. Yeah. I'm. For a minute, I thought I was not connected. Uh, what the book isn't is a book of military history. It is a book of social history of Israel through the perspectives of the IDF. Now, why did I choose to do that? You can look at Israel uh, through many perspectives, and people have done so. And Israel has changed enormously in the seven um, plus decades that um, it has existed. So um, you can look at, uh, you know, the changes from the left uh, to the right um, for two um, for, for two thirds of its history of Zionism. Uh, it, uh, the left was in control, and um, in 1977, it moved to the right, and it has, hasn't really changed since then. You know, it, it's been 42 years of control of the right. Um, it changed from um, a country and a society that uh, exported oranges and avocados to one of the largest arms traders in the world. It changed from a secular society to um, uh, an increasingly religious society. And it changed from a socialist, uh, so, so, so socialized 
society to a privatized society. Um, you can um, discuss the, uh, this society through many, many lenses. What I wanted to do is to see what is the most constant institution and the most constant um, variable that hasn't changed in the 72 years of Israeli history. And um, when I looked at all the possible variables, the IDF came up as the one thing that was set up in 1948, um, just before the state was set up, it um, was the one institution that has um, been in the at the center of Israeli society ever since. And its inf importance has only increased. It's the only institution in Israel that um, is normally supported by more than 96% of the population. Wouldn't all leaders want an institution like this in their country that they can actually control? Um, only some communist countries uh, achieved such percentages. Um, arguably, Israel has never been as divided as it is today. But that division is not actually featuring a division on the IDF. The IDF is the only trusted institution in the country, despite its many and substantial failures over the years. Those failures are always forgiven and forgotten. Why? Well, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, the IDF is the institution that was chosen in 1948 by Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister, to shape a nation out of um, uh, a ragtag um, of different people from different societies with different languages, with different beliefs. And therefore, um, he had to choose an institution where the, um, the level of partnership was very high. And of course, in 1948, um, the Israeli army arrived at 120,000 men and women. If you remember that um, the whole population of Israel then was uh, less than 650,000, then most of um, the adults were part of this institution. So it makes a lot of sense to choose the widest uh, membership club to base it on. But uh, there are some, um, you know, results to such a choice. Um, in a sense, if you choose the army as the institution of identity and um, an identity formation, uh, as they did in Sparta, you end up with a Spartan society. And this is what Ben-Gurion wanted, and he achieved it. Uh, interestingly, he points out, and I, I quote him in the book uh, numerous times on this topic, he pointed out between the years 1950, uh, 1949 and 1954, in other words, for almost six years, he has been drumming uh, the uh, story, the narrative, that there is a state, that it has an army, but that there is no nation. And the last time he's recorded on saying there is no nation is in 1954. So um, while um, he was using um, um, an expression that makes no sense whatsoever, he said that we have turned from uh, a nation that existed for 2,000 years um, uh, into a state without a nation, and therefore we need to create a nation. Of course, the Jews were never um, a nation for 2,000 years, and there is no nation on earth that existed for 2,000 years. Um, but he was not frightened of saying there is no nation, and he chose the army. And by choosing the army, he has created um, a number of um, institutions um, and institutional 
uh, results. The first one was that um, as opposed to say the public school in, in Britain, which is um, controlling um, you know, uh, you know, uh, where, where, where people are educated to be ruling the, the society. Uh, this has happened in the IDF in Israel and still happens. So IDF became the validating institution in Israel. It was the club that uh, you must belong to. And it was the measure of any other social body. Now, um, the IDF is not like any other army, and that's why I called the book that. Um, you know, how many uh, years passed since any of you have seen a British soldier? Now, in Israel, this will never happen. There will not be a day where you will not um, see uh, Israeli soldiers. And I'm not, you don't have to be a Palestinian, um, you know. Um, you will see the army everywhere because, like God, it's everywhere. It is um, in education, it is in higher education, it is in industry, uh, it is uh, in the judiciary, it is the judiciary in the, in the territories, it is the law, um, it is um, in broadcasting, uh, in the theater, in film, in the radio, uh, it has a number of radio stations since 1948. Um, it um, controls cultural production of an incredible, um, you know, to an incredible degree. Uh, for example, uh, if you want to work in the media uh, at 18, you do all you can to get into the army um, radio, the army um, channels, um, of um, you know uh, troops, um, the theatrical troops, etc., because this is the training ground uh, for uh, the Israeli media. Hardly anyone in the Israeli media has not trained and not passed through these things. Now, um, uh, because we are um, you know academics, and uh, I'm concerned about what academics do, I just also want to say that higher education in Israel is unthinkable without looking at the army. Um, the um, main income, uh, main research income, is related to um, programs that the army or another range of institutions connected to it are running for many years. Security, um, there is, uh, you know, of course, uh, a, a whole raft of programs that are about developing hardware and software, but I'm talking much further than that. Um, there are army camps. For example, there is an army camp uh, in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem uh, to which um, only the um, soldiers can enter. It's in the, on the campus. Uh, it, it's highly secret um, and it is training um, the intelligence corps and other related organizations. Uh, all uh, Israeli universities do army training. Um, in other words, um, you know, uh, the whole system of education from school to university has to train the future soldiers. And those soldiers, once they have been trained and been through the machine will continue to feed in um, the results of their research and to, to um, actually enjoy um, research income from the army. Now, uh, of course, this is not um, an accident. If you put the army as the machine of social engineering, creating a nation, uh, then that's the result you get. There is another aspect I want to point out, which I deal with the, in the book uh, quite uh, substantially, and that is the, uh, together with the social engineering task, there was the task of rewriting history. Uh, Zionism was deeply um, opposed to Jewish history. A Jewish history is not a history um, you know, milit militarized history. For 2,000 years, Jews lived 
in positions which were not enviable, which was in positions which were difficult, um, suffered racism, uh, anti-Semitism later on. Um, they were not in control uh, of their lives for most of this period. Uh, Zionism is trying to replace uh, 2,000 years of history with uh, a myth history, as Shlomo Zand calls it. Uh, the myth history of the book of Joshua, um, the story of Masada, in other words, mythologies of heroism that are supposedly the uh, foundation of the IDF. Um, so um, it was important for me to actually um, map the development uh, of this um, huge project of social engineering and its results. Uh, so this is a history of Israel since 1948 and some period before also um, is, is dealt with uh, through the lens of the IDF, how it um, scanning, how it changes and shapes and forms every aspect of Israeli life and also um, creates a situation whereby peace and just peace are actually impossible and Israelis are more afraid of peace than they are afraid of war. I think this is what I wanted to say to start with. Uh, thank you very much. Um, now, uh, that, that is really interesting. We've got some questions from the audience, but first of all, can I bring in uh, Gilbert? Uh, to uh, to come up with a few questions or with the key question, and then I have a couple of questions myself. Um, Jimbert, would you like to come in and uh, begin um, some new questions? Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Dina, uh, and uh, thank you, Hayim, from for uh, for writing this book, which is a very uh, useful and uh, very needed contribution. Uh, to, to the literature, and uh, I would say more specifically also to the uh, left-wing uh, literature, because uh, to my knowledge, this is the only book written for, from a left-wing perspective on this topic, on the centrality of the Israeli army, and dedicated to the Israeli army, to the study of the Israeli army. Uh, there are books on the market on the same topic, like... Uh, the book by uh, Patrick Tyler's uh, Fortress Israel, uh, which you, 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 you quote uh, in, in your book, and you even use, use it uh, at the beginning of, of a couple of chapters. Um, uh, uh, but uh, that, that's a New York Times journalist who did a very interesting job. But uh, here we have a, a book that is uh, from a radical, from a radical perspective, or uh, radical from a person with a radical critique of Zionism, and uh, and uh, that's that gives it a, a, a special importance and uh, and originality. Um, and I think that uh, I mean, it, in some way, uh, the, the 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 best or the clearest illustration of uh, Hayim, what you were saying about the centrality of the military in, uh, in, in Israel, in the Israeli society and state, uh, is the fact that through, I mean, your book is actually not only about the Israeli army, but about Israel to Kur. I mean, in, in some way, most aspects of what Israel is are discussed, and uh, uh, including a whole history of, of, uh, of Israel, I mean, uh, uh, if you if you write a book on, you know, on many other uh, countries' armies, you, you will, uh, of course, you'll have to deal with the wars in which these armies were engaged, and maybe uh, in the the, the changes that uh, these uh, armies went through. But here, in this case, you are writing a book on uh, on the army, but this is a book that goes into every single aspect of this Israeli society. So, so that is uh, is the, the clearest illustration of how, how central this uh, institution uh, uh, has been. And including this, it's, um, 
I mean, it covered everything of role and function in society, including the shift after 1967 into more and more police-like activities in controlling the, the, uh, the, the occupied territories. So, uh, uh, I mean, when you engage in writing the book, uh, I presume this is something that you were very conscious of and became even more conscious of while writing it. Sorry, I missed, I missed this because something... Um, could you repeat the question, please? Uh, my question is that uh, I'm assuming that when you started writing the book, when you embarked on writing the book, uh, uh, you, you had, of course, uh, uh, a clear idea about uh, uh, this centrality and the fact that writing a book on the Israeli army will, okay. will lead you to, to deal with everything in, in Israel, practically. Sure, so, yeah. And, sure. and this is something that certainly developed while you were writing the book, when you have to well, I, I, absolutely I, tackle everything. You're totally yes. right, uh, Gilbert. I wanted to write a book that will explain Israel to people who are not um, usually uh, in contact with it. Now, a lot of people in the West might visit Israel. Uh, they might go and uh, you know to to a lot, or they might go to look at birds, or they might they might go to Jerusalem, or in the past they would go to a kibbutz. Uh, but the idea that they understand the society is like the idea that a group of blind people are trying to decide what an elephant is by touching different parts of it. Um, and um, as you um, have experienced this, I did. Um, people in Britain, in Europe, in the United States do not understand Israeli society. And I thought for many years, what can I do to explain it uh, in totality, not uh, not this part, or you know, like the kibbutz has changed, or yeah, but the totality of Israeli society. And indeed, um, I found that the only way I can do that, the only way I can deal with everything in Israel, is through the army, because the army is the gateway to everything in Israel. It is the gateway to the rewriting of the history is the gateway to the creating of national identity. Uh, it is um, the one institution that every Jewish Israeli, practically, of course, there are a few people who are saner than that, but every Jewish um, Israeli uh, normally, um, you know, is, is identifying with the army. Um, that's not very surprising. They've been to the army for two or three years, they, they have suffered, they have made others suffer, this is a, um, you know, a formative experience. Um, but of course, people from outside can't understand it. So yes, I was looking for the one institution that offers um, the widest possible perspective or series of perspectives on the Israeli army. And as I started reading and researching, it became clear that I am not going to write military history, I'm going to write a history of Israeli society through the army. Yeah, absolutely, yes, and that, uh, that comes out uh, very, very clearly in the book, and that actually adds to the uh, importance and usefulness of, uh, of, of the book, since it's not dealing with some kind of marginal institution, but really uh, the institution that is uh, the most uh, defining of what uh, what the Israeli state is. Uh, here I have a question about what you said in your introduction. You mentioned 96% of support in the population, you said. I presume you were meaning the, the, the Jewish population. Right? Yes, I, I, uh, I should have said the Jewish population, of course. And in the of book, course. I made a, may a, make a point of always saying uh, of Jewish, 96% of Jewish Israelis. Um, yes. it, it, it actually is worse than that, Gilbert. Um, when they are, um, when, when a war starts, say um, 2014, they attack Gaza, um, they don't even ask the um, Arab citizens of Israel, the Palestinians, um, what they think. Um, their models 
are actually built in such a way that they are built on the Israeli uh, Jewish society. So when they publish it, they don't say 96% of Jewish Israelis, but that's basically what it is, 96% of Jewish Israelis supported the attacks on Gaza. 95% of Jewish Israelis supported the attacks on Lebanon. Um, this is um, an incredible uh, level of identification that they show with the most brutal act a society can take. And, you know, 96% of Israelis are brutal. This is, this is the question we must ask. Uh, different people will have different answers for it. Uh, but I, the question must be uh, posed. Why uh, do 96% of Israelis, and that includes, by the way, academics, that's um, um, the percentage with, uh, of academics supporting um, those wars was the same. It was 96% or 95%. So this is very worrying. And we should ask this question, how is it possible that automatic support is given to, um, uh, to, to all acts of aggression? Now, there are a, a, a number of answers to this, and they are complex. First of all, there is what is called by um, Gabriele Nouri, um, um, uh, an Israeli researcher, a war normalization discourse. Um, this war normalization discourse is very complex. It starts in the school and ends up in the cemetery. Uh, so all your life, you are told that there is no other way. We are surrounded by enemies. Um, no, uh, the whole world is against us. Um, nobody wants to make peace with us. And, you know, this is still going on, despite the fact that Netanyahu is very... Um, proud to say that he's now signed a peace agreement with, with this country and with that country, uh, the war normalization discourse continued. When Israelis are asked, as a result, when Israelis are asked that um, peace, most of them are frightened of it. They do not understand what peace could mean. Um, yes, it's a good idea to sign a peace agreement, but that doesn't mean to say there will be meaningful peace. Of course, there can't be a meaningful peace because Israel is a colonizing country which is suppressing 6 million Palestinians, 4 million without any rights, and 2 million with some rights which are, um, you know, disappearing as we speak um, all the time. So um, a country like this a, cannot be democratic because, of course, um, the Arabs are not citizens of Israel in, in, in the usual sense. No Palestinian is allowed full citizenship of Israel. And actually, Netanyahu has made that point. He said um, to a very famous actress that wanted to say that Israel is a, a, a country of its citizens, he said, no, Israel, um, after we signed the nation state law, is a country of the Jewish people. So Israel is not a country of its citizens. It's a country of a, a, a people that doesn't exist actually, because the Jewish people is not uh, a nation. It's a, a, an aggregate of people living in different countries. They don't even speak the same language. They don't share very much. And actually young uh, Jews in the state are not even sharing in Zionism nowadays. So this is, um, you know, quite a job of uh, arguing that um, your state is not a state of your citizens. So uh, the war normalization discourse normalizes war rather than normalizing peace. So that the because of the fact that Israel has fought more wars in, uh, since 1948, than any other country on earth, that it is spending per capita more on wars and security than any other country on earth. About twice the US, which is number two, yeah? Um, so uh, that it is actually having one of the largest armies, despite the fact it's a small country. You know, it, it, it's one of the smallest countries 
um, on Earth uh, or the state, uh, but it has a large army because the army includes more or less all the adult citizens. Um, it has um, an, an, a market in arms and, 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 and other security products which is huge for, for the country this size. So basically, uh, this is how it's possible to, uh, if you want to recruit uh, such percentages into behind the army and behind the state. Right. Okay. Um, sorry, Dina. Uh, do you want to have, a, can I come with one question or do you want sure, to? Sure, sure, you're the chair, yeah, of course. Yeah, um, so you mentioned it just now, which is the way that you structured the book, which I thought was very interesting, which is around the role of the army in the events, the kind of key, key, key events that have defined um, what we call normally as the Palestinian-Israeli context. I want you to elaborate on that because it's quite interesting. But I've got another question which has really been uh, Hello. Hello. Um, uh, Hello. A, a big issue, a, a big kind of, uh, a, a big entity in in the lives of the Palestinians. So, you know, so in a sense, I was wondering whether you also, I didn't see you engage with that in the book. So in a sense, for, as a Palestinian myself, you know, the, the an Israeli soldier, um, does bring a lot, immediately brings a lot of memories and ideas and, and concerns. Um, but I wanted you to comment on the structure of the book and why did you choose these events as a way to try and think of the relationship between the ideology of the state and the army? Right. Uh, I mean, about half of the book is um, dedicated to the different wars and conflicts that Israel has fought since 1948. Um, again, this is not military history. This is, um, you know, social history of Israel. And I included those um, in great detail because it's important um, to understand the role, the historical role of each of the wars. I, w I haven't got time to actually go into all of them, so I'll give you just a few examples. 1948, the most important of such wars, is the colonial war of taking over most of Palestine and getting out, um, expelling by force, most of the Palestinians. Taking most of the land, getting rid of most of the people, two thirds of the land uh, more than two thirds of the land, uh, and two thirds of the people have been expelled. And um, what this war has done, apart from what I just described, is actually established the uh, impunity of Israel from UN and international action. The UN has decreed that Israel must take back the refugees, must re let them return to their homes. Israel did no such thing. It just roughshod it. And um, that was an interesting thing. The UN could um, do something about it. But the UN was a weak, new, and actually um, very faulty organization because the UN has created the problem in the first place. It is the UN that has uh, decreed at the division of Palestine, the partition. So um, the UN proved uh, in 1948 that it wasn't better than in 1947. First, it created the problem. It led to the Nakba, and then it didn't do anything about the Nakba. And when it didn't do anything about it, it created a precedent that Israel continued to use all the time. So um, 1948 is setting a tone and actually um, creating a very important precedent. Uh, 1956, for example, is a very important war. Here is Israel, a small, insignificant country in the Middle East, uh, which is, in a sense, um, 
enticing the two large ex-empires, Britain and France, into um, um, a, a, a post-colonial or oh, colonial uh, war uh, to get rid of President Nasser and to uh, continue Egypt again after having lost Egypt to, um, you know, uh, to the British Empire control. Um, and um, they failed. Um, Israel has not failed because it has taken Sinai. Um, if not for the only time that the two superpowers came together to demand that the, the three, the tri tripartite states, leave um, Sinai and Egypt, uh, you know, Israel would still be there. Um, but what it, this war has done is prove to the Americans that um, the French are right in supporting Israel. The French were, the French and British were the armament suppliers of Israel at that point. And therefore, uh, the next uh, empire that will support Israel is the only one that counts, and that's the US. So in a sense, if you want, uh, 1956 was not just a colonial war, of course it did that. Um, but the colonies um, were, um, sorry, the, the colonials were a uh, thing of the past. Um, you know, one has to say that Israel starts colonizing very late. At the point where colonialism is not very popular, actually, it has very bad press. And, you know, it's the only colony of the 20th century, new colony of the 20th century. Um, but uh, because it has the support of the ex-colonials and the empires, uh, it can continue. Um, 1967, of course, is the war of a very different nature. And I think I will only relate to one other. Uh, and I don't think I need to talk about 1967 in great detail, because we all understand that this is the first time that the whole of Palestine was under Israeli control, of course, uh, Sinai and, you know, a part of um, uh, Syria and so on, and part of Lebanon. But the whole of Palestine for the first time was under Israeli control. And within two weeks of the war ending, they started, um, you know, first of all, they annexed Jerusalem. Then they didn't annex the other territories, but they started annexing them um, in reality, you know, the reality is also important, not just, you know, um, what people are um, pretending uh, like Netanyahu with his annexation saga. So basically they started annexing the West Bank and of course Gaza and, and, and the Syrian Heights by building settlements there immediately, not waiting. So um, each of those wars has provided um, another set of opportunities to extend the Zionist project. Mm -hmm. I just want to say a few words about 1973. This is a war that Israel was surprised um, by. It didn't, actually, they believed it's not possible. They believe that uh, they are totally safe uh, from a war until um, somewhere in the mid um, 70s or the late 70s. This this was the conception, um, and um, they almost lost. Um, they lost a lot of people. They lost a lot of grounds, and in the end, they lost Sinai as well uh, as a result of the peace agreement. Um, what is interesting about that war is that all that Israel has said uh, that they must sit on the um, um, on the water line. Uh, because if uh, it is a safer border. Uh, they had a safe border, uh, both in um, with Egypt and with, uh, according to them, uh, and with Syria, it didn't matter. It didn't matter at all. You know, they almost lost the, the, the plot and um, they couldn't actually um, come back for over 12 days. It took 14 days for them to turn it a bit. Um, this is a very interesting war because um, it was not 
popular in Israel because it wasn't an IDF war. The IDF did not invent it. The wars in Lebanon, I would uh, like to talk about later on, probably um, Gilbert can uh, also relate to that. So each of those wars is uh, playing a very different role in the rolling project of controlling Palestine and the Palestinians. Um, since 1967, of course, Israel is controlling six now, six million Palestinians. Then it was about four million. Uh, and those Palestinians are not offered anything, anything whatsoever, apart from living under apartheid without rights, without a state, without um, an area um, of contiguity. Um, basically, the Palestinian authority is uh, existing in the internet, uh, you know, because on the ground it doesn't exist. Um, and where it exists, it exists as a, an appendage of Israel. So um, I, about half of the book is about that. And the other half of the book is about Israeli society around the arm, uh, if you will, uh, about um, you know the different differences of class and, and and ethnicity in Israel, and of course nationality. Uh, about um, is the fact that Israel cannot, by definition, be democratic, because it is a Spartan racial colony. Um, at least the Spartans were not racist, um, not in this way, um, and um, you know this is um, making. Uh, it's impossible for Israel to be a democratic state, not, not to talk about a peaceful state at all. Um, and um, different um, ways in which Israel makes peace and a safe peace and a just peace impossible. And some people I saw before commented on, is it possible? You know, uh, many readers that have read the book said, I agree with everything but it's uh, actually very pessimistic. Well, mm -hmm. I uh, agree that um, it is pessimistic and you just need to listen to the news um, recently to realize that uh, despite um, every single mistake that Netanyahu has made and his government has made, um, they are not um, going to lose control very uh, quickly because of the things I have explained at the beginning, because of the IDF. It's the IDF that is in control rather than just a government. Um, can, I, you know, can, I, yeah, go on. can I come back to Schubert to come in with um, some more questions before we go to the comments from the audience? Um, to yeah, that. yeah. Yeah, thank you, Dina. I mean, uh, Haim, you, you covered a, a lot of uh, ground now in the uh, in your uh, presentation of the book. Uh, so let me just go to go back in some way uh, to uh, guys of conclusion, because after that, uh, we have to, to leave some time for uh, questions from the audience. And we, I mean, this, uh, we have five minutes. So this support uh, of the uh, Israeli Jews to the army, uh, I would say that uh, actually, uh, it's more than a support. It's an identification with the army, isn't it? In the sense that, uh, uh, of course, we can, I mean, the, the Israeli society, like any society on earth, is not monolithic. And uh, even if you let aside marginal uh, differences, but sometimes you have major splits in the Israeli public opinion. But these are not splits between who is pro-army and who is against army. These are split within the army because everybody is the army. Everybody identifies with the army, and that's why you see generals, you know, uh, at, I mean, in the political uh, arena, it's well known that, uh, I mean, if you look at the personnel, the Israeli political personnel, that, I mean, they, they, they all have a military pedigree, and some of them a very high military pedigree, people like Barak or Gantz or, uh, or, uh, or whoever. So you have this identification, and you, you, you discuss it, it's related to the settler colonial nature. Uh, of the uh, uh, Israeli uh, society. Uh, this is a nation in arms, but not a revolutionary nation in arms, a settler colonial 
uh, community in arms. So this is very specific. And let me add one point, and then you comment on that. Uh, uh, there, there was this myth of the purity of the army, which, of course, you discuss, uh, well known. And this has been very much affected by the invasion of Lebanon, you know, which, uh, which made the, the, even the, the name Israel Defense Force uh, uh, something uh, quite illusory. Uh, and then the repression of the Antifada and, and other issues. And yet, this identification doesn't stop, which would mean that we have such a shift to the right in the Israeli society that now there is a kind of cynical attitude that is, okay, even if, uh, if, if we do uh, very ugly things, they, I mean, we are in our right against the barbarians. Well, first of all, I want to read one sentence which I quote from Moshe Dayan. Um, he says, this is, this is very ironic and actually funny, but I don't think he noticed that it is funny. Uh, they said, uh, the Israeli Defense Force is a de decidedly aggressive assault army in the way that it thinks, the way that it plans, the way that it implements. Aggression is in its bones and its spirit. Um, he should know and he made it what it became. So, um, first of all, I want to say something about this identification with the army. Um, this was a very long process because the army was led um, to begin with uh, by officers from the kibbutz movement. They were the great majority of the officers and they were supposedly left wing, though um, the most left, left wing uh, movement, Hashomer Atzair, actually was also uh, in different times the most aggressive. So there is no um, easy formulation here. But in, all, in terms of identification, Mizrahi Jews could not easily identify with the army, with this type of army, with, with, with these uh, officers from, from, uh, from the Kibbutzim. They actually didn't like the Kibbutzim at all, as, as is well known. So actually what has happened over the last 50 years is that the army has become much more representative of the Jewish Israeli society, that Mizrahi uh, people are better represented there on the officer call. Um, it started as a secular army because the society was secular, and now it is very much a religious army, and the religious officers are very, very important. So this is the first thing that uh, we need to uh, consider how the army changes and how it is more representative, representative of the society. Uh, but also, as you said, the society identifies better and more closely with that army. So that army can achieve 96% um, identification because it is now more representative. In, in the old days, it would be a, a job to achieve 80% support or even 75% support. Now, it's easy. The whole Jewish population is supporting the army because it is its army. Um, it is um, representing Israeli society after many years of working on Israeli society so that it represents the army um, uh, agenda. So this is the process. The army is presenting an agenda, educating a public, educa creating a nation. That's, that's what educating a public is. And in many instances, this takes generations. It takes hundreds of years to create a nation normally. But this is a forced process, a process under enormous pressure uh, with an enormous machine uh, pushing the process towards that identification. And this is why it has become impossible, uh, impossible and why it has become uh, so popular in Israel. The more right-wing the society is, the more right-wing the army is. It is representing society. It is totally democratic in that sense. 
Okay. Gilbert, do you have another quick question or shall I move on to questions from the audience? Gilbert, uh, very little time is left. Uh, of course, we can spend hours discussing exactly. with exactly. him. Uh, yeah, and particularly what Gilbert referred to, the IDF, the name of the army is quite interesting, you know, the IDF, Israeli Defense Force. But I'm going to, I think, some of the questions from the audience you've already answered, and Gilbert uh, very, uh, you know, kind of succinctly put together the questions around the settler colonial and the colonial nature uh, of Israel in one of his questions. Um, but I think a couple of questions that I will pose to you that are, that came from the audience. One of them is around the uh, question of resistance and refusal. So we talked about the identification with the army, but also the issue of uh, resistance. How can you? Um, how can you? You know? Um, how do you deal? How how does this machinery, um, the uh, military, the army, and the uh, political kind of complex, how does it work in that context? So that's one question. And the related question, what people wanted to know uh, the relationship between the army and um, Mossad. And also to the question around uh, the, uh, the colonial, the ideological, the ideologic colonial roots of uh, the army, how it started. Uh, and I think you explained that, but maybe uh, that's one of the questions, which is the role of the colonialist ideology in the formation and the expansion of the IDF. Sure. Well, the question of resistance is um, very interesting. Um, when I was in the army um, between 1964 and 19, end of 1967, um, there was the beginning of resistance. Uh, I think the beginning of resistance was in 1965. And there was uh, one very famous um, draft resistor, Georg Neumann, who actually spent three years in jail. I was very impressed by his morality and stance. But at the time, at the age of 18, and uh, this is not to justify it, but I just lacked the moral courage to follow him and to resist the draft. Mm -hmm. And so did many others. Uh, there were every resist, draft resistor was well known. Um, the names were posted. In, uh, and actually, um, Yeshayahu Yesha Leibovich, a very famous critic of Israeli society and especially of the occupation and of the army said that the minute that there will be 2,000 draft resistors, the occupation will be over. Um, this is probably the only optimistic thing that he has ever said. He, is, he was a pessimist like me, but this was optimistic. Um, the army never had 2,000 or 1,000 or even 200 draft resistors. It wasn't like Vietnam. There wasn't a movement. This was, um, you know, drops here and there, and this is still going on. There are men and women, courageous, moral, principled. Um, we should all support them, but we should understand one thing very quickly. Israel is not going to change from within. It is moving to the right, and the few people of the left, very, very few people of the left, are leaving it rather than moving towards some kind of control. I mean, anything else, you know, and you make a political mistake. If you think that Israel will change itself, will become humane, um, you are making a very serious political error. This will never happen. Um, South Africa did not change from inside. It changed and it um, did change, not enough, but it changed and ended up apartheid because it was under the most impressive pressure from outside. Uh, and it, this pressure went on for 30 years and only then it started giving way. Israel is much stronger 
than South Africa was in 1990s. Um, it is supported by the strongest um, nations and by most nations. This is not what happened in the case of South Africa. So in order to change Israel into a democratic society that will stop being a settler colonial racist state, the most intense pressure, I'm not suggesting military pressure, I'm suggesting intense civic pressure of all societies everywhere. And BDS is the beginning of that. So resistance is important, but we should see it in the right proportions. We should support the resistance, not because they are going to bring about a moral change in Israel. Now, the IDF and the Mossad are basically a continuum, uh, and the Shabak and, you know, many other such um, dark organizations. And they are working, um, you know, there is a revolving door between those organizations. And uh, people will go from the army into the Mossad and from the Mossad into the army. Many army officers become the Mossad heads. Some people move from the Mossad into the army. This is um, a real revolving door. And of course, the more technological that the army becomes, um, the more dependent it is on remote control uh, systems of all kinds from drones to uh, new technology of the web, um, then uh, this is the case uh, even more so. Um, for example, there are around 6,000 students that um, spend the summer holidays um, working um, as, um, as trolls, if you want, um, inventing identities and writing comments um, maybe even to this talk, you know, I'm sure there will be quite a few comments uh, by this unit in um, central Israel that are created uh, by imaginary people. So uh, there's enormous budgets that are put into fighting BDS, fighting Palestine everywhere. Um, and this is, um, you know, both the Mossad, the army, the Shabak, uh, the um, of course, uh, all those feed into the government and to the ministries. Israel is the idea. Um, ideologically, that's uh, an important question. Um, I wanted to start with saying that no, um, no settler colonial state could operate without extreme violence. It never happened. It couldn't happen. Uh, so um, one of the things that such societies need to do is to use arms to take territory and to either expel or kill um, millions of people. How many millions of North American um, Indians, uh, Amerindians, were actually killed uh, over two um, and a half centuries. We don't even know, but the numbers range between 15 million and 20 million. So this is one of the largest holocausts. Um, and I would argue that uh, this is the ideology behind America. Um, America was racist from the beginning. And it's very interesting because these people were religious um, resistance fighters, you know, they suffered in Europe. They went to America to run away from all kind of um, quite murderous campaigns against them. By the time they came there, uh, they found the enemy and they spent the next two centuries or three centuries decimating it. So that now we haven't got really the, the American, they're not alive, they're the real American. Yeah, they were yeah. killed. Uh, so this was an ideology um, which most Americans are still behind, but they're not actually understanding it as wrong. And I think this is why a lot of Americans are supporting Israel, especially um, the racist whites um, of um, you know the the uh, 
uh, Christian um, born again uh, group um, because they have never stopped being racist. Uh, they are racist against blacks, they are racist against Chicanos, they are racist against uh, Arabs, Muslims. Uh, I'm sure they are racist against Jews because uh, this is what their ideology requires. Uh, you know, all Jews will be um, gone to, to hell um, when the second coming will appear. Um, but they have a role now and they have to play that role and, and Netanyahu is happy to play that role. So ideologically, it's very interesting. Uh, the ideology of settler colonial states is actually quite simple. It's about control. Um, so, now, give it uh, a number of ideological um, covers but that's what it is about. And we see the project happening over 70 something years since the creation of Israel. I think. Um, there, 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 was a question, there was a question from Lina Jayusi, which is kind of continues this topic, which is around if you could comment on the central importance of the IDF in relation to the set, continuing uh, settler colonial project. And then, well, is, is that not what makes it an indispensable institution? So in a sense, well, the colonial project is impossible without the IDF. It wouldn't happen even, if it wouldn't last one day. Actually, the only Israeli that most Palestinians meet are um, the IDF or the, um, you know, the IDF in, in, in civilian clothes, which is the, the settlers. Mm -hmm. um, who are basically part of the IDF. And um, without that continuity uh, between civic and military in Israel, Israel could not survive um, as, as, a, as a colony. Uh, mm -hmm. That confusion, that intentional confusion between the civic and the military, which uh, we see in the territories, is uh, essential for control. Uh, there are, in a sense, no civilians in Israel in the sense that you and I are civilian. You know, there are no people like that in Israel, in the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. Palestinians are civilians, most of them, but not the Israeli Jews. Uh, this is uh, partly what we're talking about. Now, of course, without extreme violence, extreme violence, unrelenting violence. And I, I'm not just talking about uh, extreme violence in terms of uh, shooting people, uh, which happens every day. I'm talking about the judicial violence, um, the destruction of houses, the judicial violence of not allowing people to build and destroying where they live, uh, the judicial theft of land, uh, the burning of trees um the, the olive tree is the is the symbol of palestine uh, it's a very very old symbol it goes back before jesus to burn olive trees is to burn palestine is to burn palestinian lives uh, there are um a number of apparitions and iterations of this violence not all of it is purely military but all of it is violent, all of it is aggressive, is illegal, is immoral. And this is the ideology. And this is what the Israelis are supporting because they know that without it, they are not in control. And without it, they will have to go for a democracy, not a Jewish democracy, which means a democracy for Jews only, but a democracy for everyone. There are 12 million people in Palestine about half are Jews and half are not, they are Palestinians. Um, if you actually had um, a, a democratic state for all of them, Zionism will be dead. Zionism doesn't want to die and doesn't want to give up control. And ideologically, that is more important than left or right or any other um, kind of cover they may take every now and then. The ideology is colonial, is racist, is apartheid. This is the uh, ideological basis uh, and the license to to kill and and to steal 
and to destroy and to expel. So I have a couple of other questions, what, which, which I think will be probably the last questions, unless the bear wants to come back in at the end. Um, one of them from the audience is about if you could comment on the on a growing religious element in the army. Um, and the second one is to think about the role of the IDF in controlling natural resources, um, which uh, is a, point, a big point of dispute. Um, so especially, especially water, how does the IDF control that? These are questions from the audience, and if you can just... Uh, uh, comment on them briefly. Um, I think these are very good questions. I like them both. Um, Israel, as I said, started as a, a rather secular society. And um, in a sense, what they have managed to do is that the seculars started believing in their um, uh, propaganda. And the propaganda was always based on the Bible because uh, what right do people from Europe and elsewhere have to um, remove Palestinians in their own country and then um, replace them? They have no um, legal right or moral right to do that. And so uh, the Bible was invented uh, as the um, you know, semi-legal uh, background for, for this project. Uh, of course, the people um, that uh, use the Bible were not religious. Um, mm. There is a famous joke, most Israelis don't believe in God, but they, leave, they believe that God gave them the country. And this is uh, true about the people uh, who have run Zionism uh, in 1948 and, and later. Uh, for them, this was just a ploy. However, because the... Um, um, educational system has used such a uh, toxic text like the book of Joshua. I mean, whoever didn't read the book of Joshua, I ask you to um, do, do me a favor and do yourself a favor and read this toxic text. It is about not just apartheid, it is about uh, genocide, um, a, a genocide not just of people, but of animals, of everything, everything needs to be burned. The seven people of Palestine need to be exterminated like uh, vermin. Now, historians doubt that this has ever happened, but this is what we grew up on. We grew up on these stories and believed in them. And um, as a result, we now have a majority of Israelis who are religious. Uh, and the majority of Israelis were religious, about 54% now, and they um, grow by a few percent point every year, are 90% uh, against any rights for Palestinians, 90%, um, okay? Uh, the Haredi are higher than 90%. So they can't be a democracy in Israel because they will never allow it. Even a Jewish democracy is not possible. So this is about the role of religion in Israel. And as I said, the army represents Israel and reflects Israel. So now the army is actually um, a religious organization as well, religionized organization, because of course um, this is serving its purpose. Um, so um, this is not very surprising. It took a um, few decades, but it's not very surprising. And I can't see a way back uh, because of the figures I mentioned. Um, about resources, natural resources, uh, I have to say that um, you all know that colonialists are not friends of the environment. Imperialists are not friends of the environment. But Israel is a very sophisticated colony. It uses um, legislation about the environment, for example, uh, to uh, expel people from areas they want uh, to build Jewish citizens. Uh, so people who were, in the case of one specific um, Umkhiran, uh, one, one community called Umkhiran, 
they uh, are Bedouins that were expelled to a certain territory in the Negev by the Israeli army in 1948. Now they are expelled from that territory. They were expelled to uh, using uh, all kind of legislation, which is about the environment. Of course, by the time they are gone, uh, they will build a Jewish city. The, the Jewish city, the, 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 the plan of the Jewish city is already there and it is go going to be called Tehran. And they have done this almost everywhere. Almost everywhere. Um, they are actually flooding Palestinian uh, neighborhoods with effluent. Um, this is what they do to the environment, not just harming the Palestinian um, society, but harming the land, uh, burning the trees. Millions of trees were probably burned since 1967 in the, um, in the West Bank. Okay. This uh, is how they care about society and about the environment. Uh, we've got maybe two, two more minutes. Gilbert, do you want to ask a, a final question or? Um, no, I think, I mean, yeah. in two minutes uh, is too short and I think Haim uh, yeah, gave a uh, uh, very, very comprehensive talk. Yep. I would, I would like just to end by saying that what is clear is that the IDF and Israel are not good for Palestinians. This is not a high order to prove. What I want to say is they're not good for Israelis. They are not good for anybody. They are not good for the environment, full stop. They are not good for rights. They are not good for peace. They are not good for um, the society in Israel. And um, what this will lead to is um, probably uh, a forced expulsion because this is what people are educated into. People are educated into racism, they accept it and they support it. And I think it is up to the rest of us all around the world to stop this from happening. This is our responsibility and we must take up uh, this duty and uh, do it like we did in the case of South Africa. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Chaim. Uh, uh, that was really very interesting talk um, and uh, a brilliant book. Uh, I've read it. I've got two copies, actually. So if you need one, I can send you one. Uh, but um, otherwise, uh, thanks to Verso for posting this. And thanks to all the questions uh, that came through. They've all been uh, very interesting. Um, and wish you a good evening. Okay, bye. Thank you both. Thank you.